Over the last several years of my journey deconstructing from Christianity, I have developed a bit of a fascination with the Apostle Paul. I am not Paul's biggest fan, and I have some very strong opinions on Paul. I think all of my opinions are probably very negative, uh, but there was something that I learned about Paul I, last year sometime that really just blew my mind and shifted my entire perspective of this this early founder of Christianity. I was listening to this course by Timothy Luke Johnson, who is a historian and a theologian, and it was called The Apostle Paul. It was all about his life and ministry. And he said something in passing, I think during the introduction, about how Paul seemed to be shady in his financial dealings and that he appeared to have been called out by the church at Corinth for perhaps lying about his finances. He seemed to have been caught in that lie and had to defend himself against it. And so what I want to do today is I want to read a passage out of 1 Corinthians, a passage out of 2 Corinthians, and then a passage out of Philippians. And let's talk about Paul and his financial dealings and this supposed lie that he seemed to have been caught up in with these churches. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 3, Paul says, this is my defense to those who would examine me. So he's saying, okay, there are people who are examining me, trying to see what I'm all about. They might be judging me. This is what I have to say. So there's something that they're questioning him on. He says, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier as, at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Who tends to a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out of the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope and thresher thresh in hope of sharing the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we do not we even more? So he's saying, okay, this is my defense that I'm giving to you. And what we can kind of gather from this paragraph is that he is defending his right to live by the gospel, to uh, be compensated for his ministry. You know, he's saying, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Uh, do soldiers serve at their own expense? Why would you plant a vineyard and not eat any of its fruit? Um, and so he is making this defense that he should kind of reap the rewards of what he's doing, what he's putting out there. Uh, and, and that, so this seems to be kind of revolved around money, around being compensated for his job. So people are questioning him on getting possibly paid to preach the gospel. And this is how he's defending himself. So he kind of sets this up by saying, this is my right. I have the right to reap the rewards. But then he goes on in verse 12 to say, nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But in verse 15, he says, but I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I still am entrusted with a stewardship. Then what is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel." So he gets really dramatic here, uh, and I think he's getting dramatic because he's being very defensive. You have accused me of something. You are examining me. You are questioning me. This is what I have to say to you. And, and he gets so dramatic. He's like, I would rather die than you deprive me of my right to boast because I'm telling you that I have every right to make money off of my preaching. God says it. He says that I have the right to live by the gospel. If I preach the gospel, I can live by the gospel. So he makes this, he builds up this case. This is why I, sh I should get paid. But I want you to know that 
regardless of the fact that I should get paid, I'm choosing not to. I could boast about the fact that I'm preaching to you free of charge because my reward is not in your money. And so you can't accuse me of preaching for money because I'm not doing that. I'm preaching to you for free. I am offering you my services for free. And so, so far, so good. It looks great. It seems as though Paul is doing this from the goodness of his heart. So now let's look at the second letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. Starting in chapter 11, Paul seems to be defending himself and he seems to be getting a little bit snarky. Now in verse one of chapter 11, he says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. He says, I feel divine jealousy for you, but I am afraid as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and devotion to Christ. So something's going on. It seems as though they have, um, he's pushing back on something it seems as though they they have maybe perhaps been uh, talking with other people that maybe are bringing up concerns about Paul. And so Paul is, again, giving a defense, defending himself. And, and he's saying, you know, I'm afraid you're being deceived by someone else. I wonder what they were deceived about. Let's read on. Now he says in verse five, indeed, I consider I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. <laughs> he's been a little bit, a little bit snarky here. He says, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. So yeah, I might not speak well, but I'm very, very smart. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you. So I, I have told you this, okay? I've made it plain to you. He says in verse seven, or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and I will refrain from burdening you in any way. Now, when you hear this, what do you think? Because I read this and, and it seems as though Paul, you know, because in, in the beginning of verse, uh, verse one, he says, I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. Just, just bear with me here. And then he says, you know, did I commit a sin in humbling myself? I preached the gospel to you for free and I robbed other churches by accepting support from them so that I could serve you. So he's kind of like, He's defending himself against some sort of an accusation that he was receiving payment from other churches because in his first letter to them, he states, I would rather die than be robbed of this, this boast that I don't get money for preaching. And he made it so clear that he was able to receive payment, but that he chose not to, that it was his duty to preach this gospel free of charge. But now in his second letter to the Corinthians, he is giving this defense about why he was receiving payments from other churches. He says, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. I'm wondering if the Corinthians, whoever wrote to him or whoever was making these accusations from the church at Corinth, I'm wondering if they accused him of robbing other churches. And so that's why he's using this language. Like I robbed other churches again. He's bear with me in this foolishness. So he's saying, this is so, this is so silly. You're saying I robbed people. And so that, that seems to be the defense he's giving. He's defending himself against this accusation of having robbed other churches. And he says, by accepting support from them in order to serve you. So he's basically saying, listen, yeah, I was getting payment from these other churches, uh, from this church in Macedonia. They supplied my needs, but I did that so that I could better serve you so that I didn't have to take money from you. We see this, this major shift in Paul's attitude toward accepting gifts and payment. And if we go to Philippians 4, starting in verse 14, he says to the Philippians, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. In verse 18, he says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received the gifts you sent, fragrant offerings, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply to every need of yours according to the riches of his glory. So he has let them know, hey, I got your payment. 
I have received full payment and more. We see this, this timeline, this order of events where Paul goes to the church at Corinth. He sends them a letter after he leaves and he says, I am not going to receive payment from you. I am not asking. I deserve it. <laughs> I could receive payment if I wanted to. The Lord says I could, but you know what? I would rather die than you to take this boast from me. So I'm letting you know that I am preaching to you free of charge. I do not take money for payment. That's just not how I operate. Then he leaves. He goes to the, the church in Macedonia. He receives full payment. Who knows how long he was receiving gifts and payment from this church. And then it seems as though word got back to the church at Corinth that he was receiving some kind of payment. And this is why you see in the second letter, second Corinthians, him defending himself against these accusations. He said, I robbed these churches. Yeah, but I did it so I could serve you. And so he goes from saying, I don't receive payment to, well, yeah, I do receive payment, but you know, I did this for you. Um, because he's being accused, he doesn't need to give this defense unless there was some sort of an accusation. He's not going to just bring this up out of thin air, right? He's obviously responding to something. We don't know. We ha we, ha we don't have the letter he was responding to. I wish we did. So we have no idea what this church was saying, what they were accusing him of, but we can make the pieces fit. We, we When we weave the story together and we see this chain of events and we see Paul getting so defensive about his finances... At the very least, Paul was accused of being shady in his financial dealings. He was at least accused of it. And he he had to perpetually give this defense against, you know, these accusations. Now, of course, we don't know all of the details. We don't know for sure what was going on with Paul and his payments. But we can see that Paul makes it very clear that he is not receiving payment from churches. He doesn't even talk about receiving payment from the Philippians. He doesn't bring them up in his first letter to the Corinthians, but in his second letter, he has to give a defense and bring them up. Why? Because they did. They brought it up. They're like, hey, <laughs> we've heard some things. We heard you're receiving payment. You said that you weren't receiving payment. What's going on here? That's just what I imagine was being said. And Paul has to give his defense. And he gets so snarky and he's like, Psh, you know, just bear with me in this foolishness for a minute. I was robbing these churches, uh, you know, and I, I really think that him using that terminology, robbing churches, was a response to something that they said to him. They probably accused him of robbing churches. And so he was just kind of uh, being snarky about it and making a point. Um, and, and, and so it, it doesn't look good for Paul, in my opinion. To me, this was such a big kind of like moment of like, oh my gosh, like this guy, this guy was not this like honest, humble guy that, that they preached to us about in church. This was someone who was very shady in his dealings, who was constantly flip-flopping on what he was saying, who seemed to be lying to churches or at least withholding information to these churches and then getting accused by these churches of being shady. And then when he's called out, he gets just like really snarky and uh, kind of flippant in his attitude. And, and we see that humility just kind of fly out the window. And it's so funny how he, he, um, he boasts without boasting. Like he says, I could boast, <laughs> but I won't, <laughs> you know, or, um, you know, I have this right, but I don't use it. Lucky you. It's this attitude of like, look how great I am. I'm doing what I want. You need to get in line. Don't listen to anyone else. Don't accuse me of anything. I was sent by Jesus. You better just straighten up and understand, <laughs> you know, he didn't want to be accused because he was constantly having to defend himself. And I just wonder why this apostle is constantly having to defend himself against other followers of Jesus. And it really just paints a picture of, of, of this whole Christian system where none of these Christians can get together and agree. They're all arguing with one another. They're all disagreeing with one another on how to approach these things, how they're supposed to behave. Should they be receiving money for preaching? Should they be boasting about not receiving money from, from preaching? Should they be lying about receiving money from preaching? Um, but I just thought it was so interesting because I had never heard this about Paul before. I, you know, it takes a lot of study to really go through these letters and to 
kind of put the timeline together and most people don't do that. And so when I heard about this, these kind of shady dealings, it really just kind of was like another check, you know, for Paul and the fraud department. I don't know that we could use this to prove that Paul was committing any kind of fraud. Um, but I do think he was being dishonest about his payments for, uh, for preaching. And I think at least he was uh, bragging when he probably shouldn't have been. He was bragging about not receiving payment when he was receiving payment. And that to me seems like a lie. That to me seems very shady. And it just makes him untrustworthy. It just kind of adds to that untrustworthiness factor that that Paul just kind of carries. So let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know if you think there's something I missed or something I didn't consider about Paul or why you think Paul maybe wasn't lying about this situation. I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are. And Paul has always been a shady character to me, but this just kind of drives the nail in the coffin. And I'm so curious to hear what you think. So uh, leave a comment, like and share, subscribe, ring the bell, do the thing. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time.